Good afternoon readers, it's Tilly here from Tilly Shelf and here's a little extra video um, because I wanted to talk about the first video that I the first video that I've read? The first book that I've read during Victober. And I guess a little bit more generally about um, women going into business or women um, seeking financial independence in Victorian literature um, from, from the very little that I know about it. Um, just out, out of interest and because it's something that I think I've heard a lot of people talking about um, the books that they're going to be reading this year and I think because of um, Lucy's challenge to um, pick a book with the, which has got a female main character um, I've heard a lot of mentions of the term a new woman um, this year which I haven't really heard before and the new woman was the idea of like a, a more confident, emancipated woman who might be like breaking with some of the traditional conventions and some of the ideas around the angel in the house and going out to sort of um, make her own money and pursue her own identity and education a little bit more. Um, and that was kind of taking into effect in the later decades of the Victorian era. Um, the woman that I'm going to talk about today was a kind of like a new woman of the 1880s, but I believe the term more dates from uh, the early 1890s. It was used by a journalist in an article and then became more of like a known concept. Um, so yeah, so the first book that I read during Victoria this year was The Romance of a Shop by Amy Levy. And last year for Victoria, I did a bit of a um, poetry challenge based thing. Um, and I read a poem by Amy Levy called Xantope. Um, and that was written in 1881. And Xantope is a really interesting poem. It takes the perspective of Socrates' wife. Um, I haven't reread the, the whole thing um, because the fragment that I've got is, is relatively long. Um, but just to highlight like one of the more interesting phrases from it, um, it's Xantope as a young woman um, looking out and, and thinking about her prospects in life. Um, and she says, uh, what cared I for the mer merry mockeries of other maidens sitting at the loom for, or, or for sharp, sharp voices bidding me to return to maiden labour? Were we not a part, I and my high thoughts and my golden dreams, my soul which yearned for no knowledge. Um, so we see this young woman who's got the ambition to, to learn and go out and prosper and do something different um, from the kind of maidenly labour that was seen as appropriate at that time, um, obviously reflecting back to um, further history. Um, so at that time last year I thought, oh, it would be really good to read a full-length book by Amy Levy um, because, you know, she sounds like a pretty interesting woman. I'll tell you a little bit about her in a sec. Um, but then in the intervening time, I kind of completely forgot um, about that. And then I heard someone mention that they were going to read, I think, Ruben Satch, and I, I really should have written down who it was. Um, I can really picture her face, but sometimes channel names just go out of my mind completely. Um, and Ruben Sachs was her second novel, and that reminded me that I wanted to read her first novel, which was The Rom Rom Romance of a Shop. Um, so I've done that, and now I'm going to tell you my thoughts about it. That was a long introduction. So Amy Levy was born in 1861. She was um, educated in Brighton and then she became the first Jewish woman and apparently the first Jewish student, full stop, um, to be admitted into Cambridge University. She didn't finish her degree um, for reasons that, that we don't exactly know, um, but she studied there for a while and went on to pursue a career as a writer um, of poetry, essays, um, articles and later novels. Um, she wrote her first poem when she was like 13 years old and managed to get it published, um, so she had success for, for, for quite a long time I suppose. Um, not like breakout success, but um, enough to kind of keep her going. Um, she was born and raised in London, apart from being educated in obviously Brighton and Cambridge like I've mentioned, um, and so this book is very much like a London London-centric book, I suppose. Um, she's got a later book of poetry called A London Plane Tree, which I'm really interested in reading. Like, she's very grounded in the city, and the city as it was um, in the, the 1880s and 18, like, the, the later period of the Victorian era. So this book has got some, like, lovely descriptions of people, like, sweeping outside of Baker Street Station, and then if you think back to, like, the 1830s, that was just something that they didn't, <laughs> you know, there, there weren't those, um, those underground stations and things. They, they just simply did not exist. Um, so I really like seeing the the change that we have um, in London over the course of the Victorian era and in the country as a whole I suppose. Um, she is also, um, she went to Florence to write some articles on the Jewish um, situation in, in Florence or she, she, wanted, she was writing about Florence for the Jewish Chronicle I believe um, and she met while she was there Vernon Lee and Vernon Lee is um, the pseudonym of um, somebody who was born Violet Paget, and like many female authors at the time she took a pen name but it seems like Vernon Lee um, carried that pen name a little bit further and um, generally presented as a man so um, Amy Levy is, is viewed as like maybe part of the um, 
a group of, of queer Victorians in, in literature and, and in the arts and, and who were maybe um, beginning to, 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 to um, not beginning to live those experiences because obviously people always have been living those experiences, but um, beginning to maybe push boundaries um, about how people thought about um, those kinds of experiences, I suppose. She was known by Oscar Wilde who edited some of her essays, I believe, and he um, wrote very highly to uh, praise her after her death, uh, which unfortunately occurred when she was quite young. I think she was 27 um, and she had experienced depression throughout her um, young adulthood and eventually did take her own life. Um, so that is the, the short life of Amy Levy. Um, so to move on to the romance of a shop, this is a, I would characterise it as a light read. It's not, it's not a big dense Victorian book. Um, it took a couple of hours to read and it focuses around four young women, women who um, their, their dad dies, they, they lose all their fortune and they have to decide what to do with themselves. And they're, they're kind of thinking about what their options are. And I just wanted to read this quote, which is from the older sister. Oh, no, not the older sister. The second oldest sister, Gertrude. Um, and she's talking about what they should do and they debate about you know going to become governesses or going to live as dependents on various relations and she's trying to persuade her older sister that they can do something different and she says think of all the dull little ways by which women ladies are generally reduced to earning their living but a business that is so different it is progressive a creature capable of growth the very qualities in which women's work is dreadfully lacking and so if you think about something like the role of a governess which um you know, Agnes Grey or Jane Eyre or, or any number of these female characters that we've seen in literature, um, they go on to, to go into doing that work and, you know, gain significant independence and fina financial stability from it. But there's only so much you can charge as a governess. And it's not, um, like, as Gertrude says, it, it's not a career that, that grows. You, you go, you teach the children, and then you, you earn a set amount from that. And you can't really expect any, any pay rises, any success, any increase in your profitability. Um, so Gertrude is set aside on something slightly more and she and her sisters are already quite good at photography because their, their father had a photography studio. Um, I think he, he mostly did it as a hobby um, and they decide to rent some premises and set up a photography shop. Um, this is obviously not without its challenges. Um, they mention at one stage that they get a lot of customers who think that the gender of their, uh, their photographers is a reasonable argument for reducing the price of the photographs. Um, and there are some times when they see a degree of um, hardship and difficulty in establishing their shop. But as time goes on, their shop does increasingly become more established. So at the start of the book, uh, one of them goes to be an apprentice to a um, well-known photographer in order to um, you know, learn more details about the trade. And by the end of the book, um, there is a mention that they are going to take on an apprentice themselves. So we can see that they've gone from being um, very much in a difficult situation to gradually gaining more footing in terms of their, their business life. Um, I read this book on the Kindle and the wonderful thing about the Kindle is it's very, very easy to highlight things. Uh, the very irritating thing about the Kindle is it's quite hard to find the things that you've highlighted um, and like to go back to like, to revisit that later on. Um, so I highlighted loads of these things about um, talking about um, convention and like the, the challenges I guess that they went into as, as a group of four women, um, then if they had male customers and um, they're saying, you know, like, she, I think it's Gertrude again, she says, is it is it not just a, a matter of convention whether um, a man comes into the shop and contracts business from us or if we meet him at a party and he's introduced by an, an older married lady? Um, surely the, the principle of the thing is the same because you still just have to use your own judgment whether or not you're going to trust him because you still don't really know anything about it. So they kind of use that kind of rational approach to decide which conventions they are going to stick to and which conventions they aren't going to stick to. And they have some like difficulties and challenges of like, where's the where's the right place to draw the line and where where can they they push to 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 do something a little bit different to to like take work from a young man if they need to um and where should they you know step back um in order to preserve like still needing to preserve their reputation and good name which is seen as still being like the most important thing um well no, maybe not the most important thing but a thing that they can't ignore and they've got this domineering aunt aunt caroline um who comes around and kind of tries to tell them what to do and tries to um keep them respectable middle class young women um rather than um letting them like go off into business as, as shopkeepers and she keeps coming and like condemning them and saying bad things about them um one of the things that i found um interesting and upsetting is obviously this being a victorian novel things go wrong 
pretty much anything that can go wrong probably will go wrong. Um, it's, it's one of the things that we know about Victorian, particularly more sensationalist novels, and I would say that this novel aims to be a little bit of a sensationalist novel. Um, and she, at one point, Gertrude, who is our main character really, um, although all of the sisters get a little bit of a, a leading role at points, um, Gertrude is really distressed and sees things that, that have gone quite wrong for her family and she thinks it is the Aunt Carolines of this world who are right, I ought to have listened to them. And she regrets that step that they took to go into business because she sees the hardship that is brought upon um, them as a group of sisters. But on the other hand, you know, it all turns out kind of all right in the end. Um, thinking about what else do I have in terms of notes? Um, Obviously, the the setup of the story is these four women um, creating a shop on their own, um, you know, independently as four young women. The plot of the story is more um, typical of a romance. It more revolves around the young men who interact with them and come into their lives. Um, I would say, I get the feeling that Amy Levy maybe was a better as a poet than she was as a writer of books. This is her first book. It very much feels like a first book. And there is a lot of kind of magpie style writing where she has picked things from, um, you know, books that we can all know and love and assembled them together into this story. So I see a very heavy influence of Pride and Prejudice, probably also quite an influence of, of Jane Eyre as well, and definitely elements of North and South. I would say in terms of sentimentality, a lot of this book echoes some of the weaker aspects of North and South, where it does get quite sentimental and emotional and, and a little bit... Um, not exactly preachy, because religion doesn't come into this as much as it does into North and South, but a little bit, yeah, overly sentimental. Um, it also reminds me quite strongly of Little Women. I haven't read that in a very long time, but I think if you liked um, Little Women and the sisterly interactions in Pride and Prejudice, um, you would probably like the sisterly interactions here, because we have all of these different, char different characters, and we have stro the Gertrude, who, like, she says that, you know, society pushed her into this situation of being a strong woman, and she's the one that's, that's the clever one. Um, maybe not the best looking of them, but she's really, like, the driving force behind them. Um, Phyllis, who's the youngest sister, who is beautiful and, um, you know, at times too beautiful for her own good. And then we've got the older sister, Fanny, who is their half-sister, and she, it says she's an anachronism. Um, belonging by rights to the period when young ladies played the harp, wore ringlets and went into hysterics and she doesn't quite fit in with their shop but she still kind of like tries to be there and provide like a motherly ladylike uh, influence on the younger girls and then in the middle we've got Lucy who's like she's not too much of either so she's kind of beautiful and she's kind of clever and she kind of like blends the two basically um, and Lucy if anything um, I guess she's, she's the, the, the stabilising force um, and like she's the one that maybe has the most sustained role because she's the one that goes as the apprentice to the photographer and then she um kind of continues um in the photography business um i suppose this is getting into more of the ending stuff um she, she's able to persist with that a little bit longer um so i then wanted to move on to maybe some more kind of potentially spoilery content, I wanted to talk about the ending of the book and also the ending of some other Victorian books which involve young women um, going into business or young women with independent fortunes, I suppose. Um, and you know, I like how things happen for them and, and what works out for them. So the, the books I'm potentially going to be spoilering for you, um, it, you know, as so much as far as you can spoil a, a, a book from you know, over a hundred years ago, um, is Jane Eyre, um, Far From the Madding Crowd, and North and South, so mostly ones that I've already mentioned, um, and of course this book. And I just, yeah, thinking about this this new woman thing that we're seeing in, um, in Victorian literature, where women are like really doing some quite determined things. So like, um, Jane Eyre, obviously very early in the Victorian period, but she sets out, you know, by herself, far from alone um, in, in terms of Victorian heroines, but she sets out by, by herself to try and earn her own money as a governess, um, breaks away from the school that she's brought up in, um, and then when she struggles to make a, you know, find stability as a governess, she go then goes and starts working in a school and doing this quite, she's quite determined to always make her own living, even though she's not going into business in the same way that the sisters from the Romans of a Shop are. Um, and then next one we've got Bathsheba Everdeen. She inherits a farm and decides to be her own bailiff. She doesn't want a bailiff. She wants to look after the farm by herself and run the whole business by herself. And that's seen as being, um, you know, quite significant and quite um, 
an edgy thing to do. And then finally, Margaret Hale. For most of the time, Margaret Hale is a dependent daughter, like a uh, struggling, uh, poor gentility type thing. Um, but then at the end, she inherits, uh, again, inherits a large fortune and um, is trying to go into business and work out how to look after her estates and things herself. And all of these women at the end, <laughs> they get married <laughs> and they stop. Like, I, I guess it's, it's just like, it's the slight disappointment, I suppose, that I feel as a modern young woman, um, looking back over these characters and seeing like Jane Eyre, she inherits her fortune um, and she brings Adele back to teach her, um, but she doesn't do any more in the way of work. She just goes into that role of being a uh, wife of a country gentleman. As far as we know, obviously, we don't get every detail about her life. Um, but she, it's like she doesn't need to support herself anymore, so she doesn't. Um, then we've got um, Margaret Hale. She's she goes to um, Mr. Thornton with this business proposal of how um, you know he's going to rent her mills and they're going to make a profit together. Um, but you know we both know that they're in love and we want them to get married. I'm not saying we don't want them to get married, but the idea that the impression that I have is that they get married and then you know it's his mill, so he doesn't have to rent it and he just does all that mill business and then she just takes on the role of being a wife. Um, likewise, Bathsheba Everdeen, her role in the farm declines over the course of the book. So she starts out as being the bailiff um, and trying to control things as much as possible. And then gradually over the course of the book, Gabriel Oak supports her more and more and more and takes on the role of her bailiff and eventually takes on the role of her husband. And we can see her really retreating from the farm to the point at one stage that she's really just like shut in um, to one room in her house and she's not even really managing even her household. And it's like, what what do these stories really tell us about women's capacity to to work and succeed? It's kind of saying, yeah, they can do all right in their 20s, but when they get to their 30s, they're best off being mothers. And it, it's just a little bit frustrating that the we get that progression and we get that, that sight of women like starting to have some independence and then it, it kind of gets taken away at the end. Um, the Romance of the Shop kind of has both halves um, because we have um, Lucy, who I mentioned, she carries on with the photography trade. Um, again, it's, you know, it's a spoiler for the book, for, for all of these books. Um, but she gets married and it says that she does continue with the photography even after she's married. That said, she specialises and she becomes a specialist photographer in photographing young children. So instead of doing the things that they were doing when they first started out in the photography building with a business in which involved, you know, photographing corpses for um, you know, memorial photos and photographing um, artist studios and things. She, she lets go all of that kind of scandalous, um, like slightly more risky, I suppose, work and just becomes like a mother who takes pictures of other mothers and their children. Um, so she does slot more into that traditional women's role, although she is still um, earning, making money and building that business side of things. So it's kind of like a mixed role. The main, <laughs> the main sister, this is the, I guess the, the most disappointing thing, the main sister, the main character, um, the one that's so determined for them to all go into photography as a, as a, as a role, um, then gets married completely out of her class, like very Elizabeth Bennet's marrying Mr. Darcy style um, relationship. Very predictable. I would say the romance of a, job, the sh of a shop has some very predictable elements to it. Um, gets married to this, this guy and then no mention whatsoever of her ever taking up a camera ever again, um, despite all the time, effort, um, thinking, like just everything that she put into making that photography business a success, and it was a success um, later in the book, um, it just is gone, just doesn't seem to matter anymore. And yeah, I guess, I, did, I mean, did, um, is it uh, is it just me, or do you also find this slightly deflating, or do you find that the the romantic fulfilment of the women getting married, um, the female characters in these books getting married at the end, um, whether that balances out the um, the slight disappointment that we feel of them no longer um, having their own financial independence and career fulfilment, um, and yeah, I guess like there had to be a transition period between women hardly working at all in a recognised sense, particularly middle class and upper class women, obviously women in lower classes have always worked and always had to work, and that's kind of leaving that aside I suppose. Um, there had to be this kind of tr transition period where women would work a little bit and then get married and then maybe work a little bit less, um, leading up to what we have today where it's n normal for both parties to, to have a job normally. Um, but yeah, like, what, what do you think of that? Um, and have you found the same in other Victorian books that you've read, or is this something that, that 
ever frustrates you or do you think that's just normal for the time and well obviously it was not normal for the time um but and you're just happy to see any little bits of uh, progressive feminist um women starting shops and stuff in, in your books and have you read the romance of a shop by amy levy and if so what did you think of it um so i've just tried to do that as quickly as i can <laughs> i managed to get 20 minutes which is you know so so um thank you very much for watching and i hope you're enjoying victober <laughs>